as it was in the beginning. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Our second lesson comes to us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading verses 16 through 24. And as we re- read these kind of bullet point lists and sentences that the Apostle Paul writes, in all reality, what he is listing for us is this, this marvelous list of of ways that we can live as we prepare and wait for the Lord to come. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not extinguish the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything. Hold on to the good. Keep away from every kind of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is the word of our God. Alleluia. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. Please stand. The Gospel according to John, chapter 1. Here is the one in our Gospel lesson that Isaiah is talking about as the Lord talks about sending this Elijah to prepare the way. He was referring to to John the Baptist as he prepared the hearts of people to be ready to receive the Savior. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as an eyewitness to testify about the light so that everyone would believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. This is the testimony John gave when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny. He confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, Who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Then they asked him, Who are you? Tell us so we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. They had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked John, Why then do you baptize? if you are not the Christ, or Elijah, or the prophet. I baptize with water, John answered. Among you stands one you do not know. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. These things happened in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the singing of verses 1 through 3 of our next hymn, Hymn 14.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This Advent season, we have been pondering some questions in connection with the return of Jesus on that day of judgment. They are questions that have been prompted by the 2020 vision of the Lord who knows and sees everything about that day. We have asked the question, are we ready? We have examined to see if we are preparing in repentance. And today, we ask the question, will that day be great or will it be dreadful? Our lesson here this morning tells us that the answer to that question depends upon our relationship with Jesus while we are living here on this earth. It depends on the way that we view his first coming and as to whether or not we have received him in faith as our Lord and Savior or not. And so for that very reason, for some, that day will be great. And for others, that day will be dreadful. So, on this third Sunday in Advent, we we turn our attention not only backward to view the first coming of Christ in the flesh, but we also turn our attention forward to his coming again on that last day when he will judge the living and the dead. And then, then we ask ourselves the question, will that day be great or dreadful for us? Here a portion of our first lesson once again here from Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Look, the day is coming, burning like a blast furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord of armies, a day which will not leave behind a root or branch for them. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise and there will be healing in its wings. You will go out and jump around like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked. They will surely be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I take action, says the Lord of armies. So what is it that is going to make that day of judgment dreadful? Well, read through scripture and you will find again and again that the punishment that the wicked will receive that day as being spoken of and described as 
being absolutely terrible. Jesus says, the the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the book of Revelation, we are told, but the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And then again, in the book of Revelation, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. And likewise, here in our lesson, the prophet Malachi pictures the dreadfulness and the awfulness of that day. He says it will burn like a blast furnace and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, a day which will not leave behind a root or branch. His picture makes it very clear that that day is going to be intense. It is going to be terrible and it's going to be complete. The arrogant and the evildoer will forever be excluded from God's kingdom and from any and every good thing that comes from God's gracious hand. And you know, sadly, and and, and very unfortunately, there are many people in this world that don't want to hear about the dreadfulness of that day. Why, why, Why make me feel so bad? They say, oh, God would never do that, they they reason. That's just depressing. Why, Why would we want to talk about that? And then, then there are others who mock everything about that day by simply saying, yeah, whatever. That's, that's the sentiment that's expressed in the words and actions by, by those who make light of sin and his threatened punishment. They laugh at and they scoff at God's threatened punishment. And so, God's call to repentance goes unheeded. The cross of Christ is looked at as being unnecessary. And they just continue on in their arrogant and their prideful, sinful ways. But you know that the Lord had his writers of scripture take great pains to make it very clear that that judgment and that punishment is going to come on that day. And he he took such great pains to have them write that, not because he delights in announcing the fate of the wicked, but rather, but rather because he desires to warn them of that punishment that they might turn from their wicked ways and turn to the Lord while he may be found. You know, there there is another side to this Judgment Day coin. And that is that for some, that day is going to be great. It'll be a great day for all of those who, in repentant faith, fear the Lord. And that means, to fear the Lord, that means to to be filled with a a reverence and awe and a, a humble devotion to God. And you know, that that too is something that is repeatedly spoken about in Scripture. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Instead of being afraid, Christians, we will be welcoming Christ because it means that this, this is going to be the fulfillment of all of his gracious promises. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. The Christian will rejoice because we will get to hear the master say on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. What joy indeed. And did you notice how Malachi brings that joy across the sun of righteousness will rise and there will be healing in its wings you will go out and jump around like calves from the stall you will trample the wicked they will surely be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I take action like that that young calf that's been cooped up in the stall all winter long and is is released in the springtime goes out jumping so the believer believer in Jesus looks forward to heaven 
because of the joy that it brings as it replaces all the sorrow of sin. The believer looks forward to the freedom of heaven after all of the daily doses of evil in this life. But, but maybe you're wondering, well, what, what is Malachi talking about there when he says that the wicked will be trampled and be like ashes under our feet? Well, well Malachi and the people of God during Malachi's day, the Israelites, they were oppressed by the wicked. And they were sick and tired of seeing those wicked prosper, while those who sought to do God's will and to put God first didn't have anything to show for their devotion to God. But here, in these words, God assures them. Assures them that the day is going to come when the prosperity of the wicked and the adversity of the godly will be reversed. And the godly will be victorious. So we come back to that question. What type of a day is that going to be for you? Will it be great or will it be dreadful? Dear friends, that's a question that all of us need to be asking ourselves, and it's a question that we must answer. And our our lesson here this morning, Malachi helps us to understand the answer to that question as he explains how we know what judgment will be handed out to whom. To the wicked and the arrogant, the evil, they'll receive that burning furnace. While all those who, who believe in Jesus Christ and fear God's name They will rest under the wings of the Son of Righteousness. So which one, which one are we? Now before you go and and just simply brush off all the arrogant and the evildoers as being all of those who slept in this morning and didn't want to come to worship, or or all of those who, who in their words and their actions have given an indication that God isn't all that important in their life, or, or you think that it only explains all of those who are out there who, who say they don't want anything to do with Jesus or with church, Understand that this also describes those who may come to church on a regular basis but then forget both willingly and conveniently that their devotion to God does not end the moment that we walk out those doors. Before we just excuse ourselves from this list of arrogant and evildoers, notice that these words do not say the really arrogant or the notoriously bad people. This also also describes us when we read God's word and we think, God, I I see and I know what you're saying to me there. But, But you can't possibly mean me in this situation. You want me to be happy, right? You can't really expect me to to always be be doing what you want me to do. And it can't be that big of a deal if I I don't. Lord, is it really something that I need to be that concerned about? I mean, if I do everything you want me to do, it's going to make my life hard. Yes, before we we go and pass by these words thinking that they don't apply to us, and they only apply to those people who don't want Jesus or don't think they need Jesus in their lives because, well, he's not very important to them. Understand this also describes those individuals who who live outwardly good lives, but then think that their, their part in the family of God and their belonging to the family of God is a result of the things that they have done rather than Jesus Christ. Yes, you see, arrogance and doers of evil doesn't just describe what other peoples do. We're all guilty of it. And because of that, every single one of us deserves to face the consuming fire of that last day. And and you know what? If this is the way that we are going to live, perfectly comfortable with our sin, unrepentant, more concerned about doing what we want than what the Lord asks of us? Well then, 
to look forward to that last day is an absolutely terrifying thought. But dear friends, it doesn't need to be terrifying. In fact, for you, it isn't. Because you see, as I stand up here today, I see people who joined with me in confessing our sins. I see people who, I pray, joined with me in confessing those sins and didn't just speak those words rolling off of your tongue mindlessly as if this is just something we do every time we get together for worship. No, I I see people who I pray, who I pray, not only confess those sins, but we're sorry that you committed those sins. People who recognize that the only way to have those sins forgiven is by the blood of Jesus Christ, your Savior. I see people who purely by the grace of God and the working of the Holy Spirit fear God's name. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, to fear God means to hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves. To fear God means that you hate the idea or the thought of doing anything against God's word. Yes, you fear him when your life of repentance is seen not only in the words that you speak, but also in the lives that you live as you turn away from those sins. But there's even more to it than that. You fear him when in faith you claim nothing but the merits and the works of Jesus Christ as the only way for the forgiveness of sins. You fear him when your heart embraces Jesus and clings to him and places your whole self into his hands. True fear of God takes place when your heart directs all of its trust and all of its confidence to God alone and lets nothing in this world rip you away from him. And dear friends, that confidence, that trust that you place in him, it is not misplaced. For what does the Apostle John say to us? He says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. You see, as true God, Jesus lived a life completely free from any arrogance, from any evil doing, any sin at all. And yet, even though he lived an absolutely perfect life, he died for sin. Not his own, but for yours. For mine. For the entire world. There at that cross, he endured the all-consuming wrath of God, which is that consuming fire, the one that we deserve because of our sin. And he did it so he could give to us his life and his death. He did it so that we do not have to look to that last day in dread. You see, that's the whole idea behind Malachi's picture of Jesus as the son of righteousness and the one who brings healing in his wings. What the son is to the natural world, that's what Jesus is to our soul. He is the light of truth. Where sin brought death into this world, Christ brings healing. The healing of righteousness, won by the perfection that he lived throughout his entire life. The healing of forgiveness, won with his innocent death on the cross. The healing of a life, true life, given with his resurrection from the dead. And that's what he came to earth to accomplish the first time. You see, with his very first advent, he came on a rescue mission. A rescue mission to rescue us. And to rescue us from the dreadfulness of that last day. Because without Jesus, that's the only way that we can look at that last day. But with Jesus, and because of his perfect life and his death on the cross, because he, with his very own life, paid the ransom price to buy us back from the claws of Satan and the quicksand of sin, and because we, by faith, believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that dread has now been replaced with eager expectation. That gloom has been replaced with joy. And that fright has been replaced with confidence. A confidence that has as its greatest proof the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you one final time. What will that day be for you? Will it be great Or will it be dreadful? 
Oh, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, redeemed by the blood of Christ, made perfect and holy by your Savior's life and death and resurrection, children of God, made so through the waters of baptism, when you rest beneath the forgiving wings of the Son of Righteousness in faith-filled fear, You know the answer. For you, that day will be great. Amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the Church for Advent, which we find on page 11 in the service bulletin. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, Use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us today to heart the words of John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Heavenly Father, in whose hands are the issues of life and death, we thank you that you are a God of love and mercy who is truly concerned about the welfare of those you have made your own children through faith in Jesus. Into your tender keeping, we commend our Christian brother, Rick Seelan, and our Christian sister, Georgine Provost, the mother of Carrie Kellum. We ask, according to your will, that you not only spare their lives in the midst of their illness and hospitalization, but that you also restore strength and health to their body and minds. Guide the hands of all who care for them. Bless medications that are administered. And although we do not fully understand the reason for this suffering you have allowed, nevertheless, direct Rita, Carrie, and their families and us to take comfort in the knowledge that all things work together for good to those who love you. Encourage them to cast all their cares upon you and to trust without failing that you indeed care for their loved ones. In these anxious hours, move them to direct their eyes to you and see the love you have for their loved one, letting them know you will not allow anything that will not be for their eternal good. According to your will, we ask this, Lord, resting all our confidence on your unfailing promises. And now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. And until you do, help us to remember that you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. seated for our final hymn. We will sing verses 1 through 3. could say that just in different ways our Lord inspired his writers of Holy Scripture to bring to us that same repetitive thought. Are we ready? Are we prepared? By asking ourselves the question, will that day be great or dreadful for us, we are simply asking, are we ready? Are we prepared? And the answer is, we are ready and we are prepared when we live in that repentant faith that, that humbly confesses all of our sin and tries to hide none of it from the Lord and says, who I am, Lord, could never be welcomed into your heaven, but who you have made me, well, through Jesus Christ, you've told me heaven is my home. And when we are prepared in that repentant faith, we know the answer and we can respond with joy and eager expectation that indeed, for us that day, will be great. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. A joy to worship with all of you here this morning. A, a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today as well. We'd love to have you sign our friendship register that you find on the square table in the gathering area on your way out as well. Um, you see the announcements before you in the service bulletin. Please note that this evening there will be a faith teachers meeting at 6 o'clock here in Black River Falls and a council meeting this Tuesday at 6 p.m. in Cataract. Um, also take note that next week, Sunday, will be our youth group meeting, and that'll be at 2 o'clock here in Black River Falls. And then also take note of the, the children's Christmas bag donations needed. Um, 
The information concerning the devotion book swap is, is found there in the, in the service bulletin as well, as well as those Christmas service times for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and New Year's Eve. And then just the, the one announcement reminder that, that with the suggestion and, and the approval of the, the church council, this coming Wednesday um, at our Wednesday evening Bible class at 6.30, I will be presenting just a bit of a, a call comparison between the two calls that I am currently holding. Um, I will also do it this morning after the worship service at Cataract down in Cataract as well. So if, if you are interested in seeing the difference between what is being asked um, between the two congregations here at Faith and the one at St. John's in, in Goodhue, and perhaps to, to share some of your thoughts with me, you're certainly welcome to come to that, that Bible study hour on Wednesday or to the service, or I should say the Bible study hour after service this morning in Cataract. Um, I, I believe that that touches on pretty much everything in the service bulletin. The one thing that's not in the service bulletin is that the offering envelopes for the year 2021 can be found on the white table to the left of the pictures hanging in the gathering area. God's, God's richest blessings to all of you on your day, and God be with you till we meet again.